we have Miss Zaria up here. And, and she's been painting and she's been just sitting in the presence of God. And it was so funny. I don't know what she was going to be painting because I asked her this morning, hey, you have an idea? She's like, nope, I'm just going to paint whatever the Lord gave me. And actually, the, this, this, this verse uh, is, is what I have this morning. And I think it's awesome that she is actually drawing it. And it fits in what we're going to be talking about today. It's taken from Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight? It's in the law of the Lord. Bring it, bring it up here. Bring it up here, girl. Let, let everybody see. Let everybody see. And as you hold it up, I'm, I'm going to read this next line. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord? And who meditates on his law day and night? That person is like a tree. Planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in its season. And whose, li- uh, whose leaf does not wither. And whatever they do, prosper. Yes. And I love that. Even though we did not set this up. But how many of you know that's, that's a God set up right there? Right? That God was going to speak to her and, and, and in painting. And how many of you know that our God is so creative? And we want to cultivate creative worship. And this is one of the ways to do it. Can we give a hand once more? Thank you so much for creativity. And, and we're going to have to put that up somewhere later on when we have a church office. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to have to keep that. Thank you so much, Zaria. Can everybody say God bless Abba Youth? Awesome. Awesome. God bless you all. Thank you so much for serving us this morning. Great. Okay. Uh, now, how many of you know that this morning was a little different? Just a little bit, yeah? But how many of you know the difference is good? Okay, like two people. Got it. I said, I believe are y'all awake this morning? Okay. Awesome. Great. So, uh, I, I just want to say good morning to you. And before I start, I, I, I really feel like God wants to speak this passage over us, and I think it fits with everything that's been spoken today, that's been sung today, that's been uh, uh, released today into the atmosphere, if you will. And, and it's the words of Jesus. Uh, it's the word of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Uh, and the Bible says, come to me. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I just want to highlight this. I will give you rest. Let's pray again. Father God, we pray that this morning we get an encounter with you. That this morning, God, we get to encounter your word that is alive and well. That, God, you speak into us, into our situation, into our being in this moment, into our mindset, our current frame of work. God, we thank you that what you're about to do is to release us to go to the next level. And, God, we surrender this moment into your hand. God, we bind every spirit of unbelief. In the name of Jesus, you are not permitted to operate right now. Every spirit of antichrist, every spirit that tries to hinder us from seeing Jesus as Lord, from seeing Jesus as King, we bind your operation right now in the name of Jesus. But instead, God, we lose submission. We lose truth. That, God, we may receive revelation that comes only from you. We thank you, God. We surrender this time into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone who believes, say Amen. Awesome. Hey, what a beautiful and powerful promise that we have received from Jesus. He wants to give us, what? Rest. Now, this leads me to uh, my next question. When uh, you think about rest, what are some words that just comes to mind? Sleep. Yeah? How many of you agree with that? How many of you need some sleep today? Just don't do it here. No. Awesome. (laughs) Okay. Now, uh, yeah, you, all of us would relate the word rest with the word sleep. Is that correct? Now, there are those of us who have no problem sleeping. How many here are sleepers? Sleepers? Okay. And, and what that means is you have the gift of sleep. You, you, you can sleep anytime, anywhere, and you can sleep through anything. However, I like to propose that there's a difference between being asleep and being rested. That there's a major difference between being asleep and being rested. 
The truth is, you may be asleep but still remain restless. Have you ever, have you ever slept in and woke up still feeling exhausted? Anybody? You slept like 10 hours, 15 hours, and you wake up like you just, I don't know. You're like, I'm still so tired. Is it, is it possible? Is it possible that maybe your sleep does not guarantee your rest? Here's what I believe. Sleep was designed for our bodies, but rest was given for our souls. Sleep was given for our bodies, but rest was given for our souls. And that's why, Jesus, you will find rest for your souls. How many of you here need to be so rested? <laughs> At the end of the day, this is why we need to find rest in who God is. Because it is only when you find rest you can truly feel at peace. That you can be rejuvenated, to be energized. That's why it, 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 it just confused me when I see believers without passion. When I see believers live their life without no passion, without no dream, without no drive. Here's what it tells me, that you are restless. That you haven't found rest in your soul. Then how can you love God with all your soul if you haven't found rest in your soul? So I'd like to propose that this morning we are going to learn how to do that. Amen? Then there are those of us who have a different struggle. Maybe some of you here are struggling to sleep. You're called wakers. But not because you want to, because you feel like you have no choice to. And what happens to the people who are wakers, the, the reason that you have being awake may differ. But for some of you, there are some conversations that are present in your mind about the value of resting. Some of you think that resting is for the weak. Sleep is for the weak. Some of you are thinking maybe resting is a waste of time. Or you say stuff like this, I will rest when I. Okay, some of you are very familiar with that. I will rest when I die. And that's why it is written in many tombstones. Rest in peace. But that also communicates to you that while you were alive, you were restless. Can I tell you that maybe for some thinking that death is the only way I'll find rest. Can I tell you that for those who don't believe in Jesus, you might not find rest. Even after you pass away. And, and how many of you know that what God wants to give you is not rest when you die, but rest when you are alive. Amen. How many of you would like that in your life? To be rested as you are alive. So when you close your eyes and, you, and, and your body enters into a state of slumber, but your mind is active. Anybody feel that way sometimes? <laughs> Notice 90% are ladies. There is almost a sense of guilt or even failure if you allow yourself to rest a bit. So you find yourself constantly thinking all the time, and you find it almost impossible to shut off your brain. You live in this way long enough, exhaustions become your norm. Torment becomes your daily bread. You were not designed by God to live this way. My brothers, my sisters, you are not designed by God to live this way. You were not by the way, the only people feeling this way because the people that Jesus was uh, living with and he was speaking into in that time, uh, Jesus was speaking these beautiful words and, and those people also understood what we feel. This was spoken in a time where classes or subgroups of, uh, of people were divided by wealth and spirituality. There were, uh, I, I like to break them down in three levels and maybe you can understand so that when you read this passage, you understand the context of it. Uh, they were the white collars, like what we would know today as the white collars. These are the, the spiritual elites, if you will. These are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they were considered the heroes in those days. Even though now we look back and we look at them, we go, no, they're the bad guys. No, they were not the bad guys. They were the heroes in that time because during a time where everybody else was walking away from faith, they were the ones saying, no, we must hold on to faith. And they were the one encouraging the people to come back to God. And what has taken place uh, is this, that uh, during the time of Jesus, Jesus was exposing maybe their intent. Is the laptop okay? Thank you, Jesus. Let me just make sure. 
And they were making sure that, uh, that, that, that the people were still holding on to tradition, holding on to God. Uh, because they were all waiting for the Messiah, and they were uh, the one making sure that people were paying attention to what God is doing on planet Earth. As a matter of fact, they become a representation of who God is. They were so close to God that if you were rejected by them, it was like being rejected by God. These were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These are the white colors. And there's the blue collars. There are the people who are your average shows, people who are at work. They were working hard to live a good life. Maybe you could relate. They were working hard to live a good life. They were trying to attain the favor of these Pharisees and these Sadducees. Ultimately, they were trying to please God. And yet they find themselves in exhaustion. These are your fishermen, your farmers, and your people who, who are shepherds, who watch sheep, and uh, they were the ones that are taking care of things that, uh, that, that is needed on the daily. On the daily. Can I have just somebody maybe help me later on with the, with the PowerPoint? It's not. Uh, okay, there it is. Okay, awesome. There we go. I'm so sorry, guys. And the last one is... Uh, it's what we call the, the no-callers. <laughs> and these are the, the sinners and the rejects and the outcasts. They were the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and the criminals. Rejected by society and awaiting judgment from God. Because as the re- uh, religious leaders deemed them unworthy of the mercy of God, they felt doomed for all eternity. And can you imagine when Jesus spoke these words? He says, come to me, those who are tired and weary. Even the elites, do you think it's hard to keep up an appearance? Have you ever tried to keep up an appearance to try to please people you don't even like? Anybody? That you try to keep up with the Joneses and the Smiths and the Wongs and the Parks and whoever your neighbor may be. And you only find yourself with this painful truth. They don't even care. And yet you care. And you care deeply about what they think. And the fact that they don't care makes you hurt even more. And they're not even thinking about you. (laughs) Can I tell you that maybe there's a better way? That you may find rest in your soul. To those who are working hard toward the approval of God and those who believe that God has given up on on them, these words are an invitation to rest. These words were an invitation to an eternal life. This was the gospel message communicated in a way that they would understand. And I I know that the words of Jesus still stands today. Amen. It still stands today. As we are hearing these words being uttered into the atmosphere, there's a power to destroy wrong beliefs. There is power uh, to destroy the power of, of darkness that blinds us from the truth. And how many here would love to experience this promise of rest for your souls? Amen? So this is why this entire month we're going to learn how to take a 10. And this is our new series, Take 10. And, uh, and do you know that God also gave us a 10? Uh, the 10 commandments. And now some of us are thinking, 10 commandments as rest? Yes, for those who belong in the new covenant, 10 commandments is a rest to us. And I, I'll explain to you what that means. Now, you, have you ever heard this expression before? Hey, you need to take a 10. If you've, been, if you've ever had a job, you know exactly what this is. Right? It's a common expression if you've been employed. It's the idea of finding rest between work. To re-energize, to refocus, and to realign yourself mentally, emotionally, and physically so that you can give your best to those that you're serving. Or it it can be used to repost what you had for snack on Instagram. Uh, Now, here's a question I want to ask you. How do you spend your 10? Or do you waste your 10? Within this next few weeks, we are going to learn how to take 10 as the blessings that they were meant to be for those of us who belong to Jesus. We are now new creatures with 10 new features as a part of who we are now in Christ Jesus. The first week we're going to address is the matter, is the heart of the matter, and it is the matter of our hearts. Who God is in our hearts will determine how we live out our lives. This is why worship matters. Tell your neighbors, worship matters. You see, your worship matters in finding rest. When we think of worship, oftentimes we begin to think with the wrong questions. You see, worship does not begin with how. Worship does not begin with what or where or when because worship is not an event. 
Can I say that one more time? Worship is not an event, but yet we treat worship like an event. Worship was never meant to be an event. We see, worship begins with these questions, who and why. It deals with who you worship and why you worship him. It's a very, very important question to answer. So today we're going to answer these primary questions concerning the matter of worship so that we can get to the worship that matters. And we are going to be reading from Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. This is going to be uh, where we're going to be spending time today. The people of God in this particular passage uh, it has been enslaved in Egypt for, uh, for years and years. And the people of God has witnessed the love and the power of God in rescuing them from the bondage of the superpowered nation called Egypt. Where they were enslaved and worked to death. How many of you know how that feels like sometimes? That you are being worked to death. And their value as human beings were measured by what they can contribute. Sound familiar? And the moment they have stopped being useful, they were cast aside. How many of you are like, what, this is Egypt? Sounds like. They were ruled by a man who considered himself a god or a boss. And the truth is humans make really crummy gods. Is that right? And uh, when he was not pleased with the people of Israel, he made their lives harder to bear as if life is not already hard. So they cried out to God, and God raised up a man named Moses. How many know Moses? Uh, to one day deliver that Moses was born in the midst of mass genocide, which was decreed by Pharaoh, Pharaoh the, the king or the ruler of that day himself. Yet Moses was rescued by the daughter of Pharaoh who raised him as her own. Can you say drama? I mean, that is the story of Moses, but how I many you know that that's a God set up? See, Moses was not raised in a slave camp. He was raised in a palace as royalty. God, in his infinite wisdom, knows that Moses won't be able to deliver his people from slavery if he himself thinks like a slave. And so God had him brought to the palace and raised in the palace. Moses, even with all his flaws and insecurities, but yet he was called into co-laboring with God in redeeming his people. God moved in power and delivered his people out of Egypt. And they, he, he began to lead them towards the promised land. Canaan is supposed to be a place of rest. That's where God is leading them towards. But I think the people of God misinterpret what God was saying when he was leading them to Canaan. Because they think in their mind, well, Canaan is the final destination. That Canaan is when we will begin to rest. Because in between, the, uh, between, uh, between here and Canaan, there is no rest. Yet they don't realize that the Lord of the Sabbath was traveling with them. Yet they don't realize that rest was right there with them in front of their faces, but they miss rest. How many of you know that you can go to Sunday services, go to cell groups, go to discipleship, but yet if you never encounter Jesus, you never encounter rest. You never encounter rest. And and this is the condition of the people of God. And in the midst of their journey, they were physically free, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually still bound. They came to, my, the, to Mount Sinai, and here God gave them the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given to the people of Israel to drive them towards God, to drive them towards understanding that they need God, and they can't do life without God because God is life. But when God is not their source, what was meant to be a blessing becomes a burden. I wonder how many of you live your Christian life that way. It was meant to be a blessing, but to you it becomes a burden. I wonder if God is your source or you are your source. If you can't say amen, you say, okay, awesome. We're going to get started. Verse 1 to 4, y'all ready? Okay. Can we read this together? Or can y'all read it out here? The lighting, huh? It's a little off. Okay, I'm going to read it for you then. Is that cool? Uh, Exodus 20, verse 1 to 4. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. So I just want to hi highlight these words first and, and break it down to us real quickly. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your. He introduced who he was and what it is that he has done for his people. 
I am the Lord your God, and you shall, ha- you shall not have no other gods before me. When we think of this, this sounds like a divine word. No, these are actually a covenant word. This is a marital language. The way this is described, this is what a husband would then say to a wife, uh, the one that he has already given dowry over. Do you know that, uh, that, that a woman in those days were considered to be in captivity in her father's house until a man or a groom comes and pay the dowry and pay the price to purchase her as his own? I'm not saying that she is a possession, but this is just, you have to understand, this is the culture, uh, the, the culture that was lived out in that time. There had to be a payment. There had to be a sacrifice laid before you can win the bride over. And, and, and the first thing that, that the groom will say is, I am your groom, and you are my bride. So when God was declaring this, this is not just declaring that he is the God of the universe, even though he is. But isn't it beautiful when he goes, when he's saying that I am the Lord your God, here's what he's saying. I'm your husband, and you're my wife. I am yours, and you are mine. Isn't that beautiful? For the single ladies in this place, can I tell you that Jesus proposed to you first? And for the fellows who are single, yes, you are a part of the bride of Christ. It's fair because God called the ladies the sons of God, and he calls also the fellows the bride of Christ. So it's fair. Praise Jesus. Okay. (laughs) God wants an exclusive relationship with you. It's a marriage relationship. He will not share you with anybody else. You understand that? He, this is an exclusive, like, and a relationship that the Bible describes as a relationship uh, compared to us and, and God. It's like the, the relationship between a husband and a wife. That's found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 32. You find the relationship Paul describes as a relationship between Christ and the church. You see, worship matters to you when God matters most to you. As a matter of fact, I just want to bring out this other passage in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 13 to 16. You have to understand how much God values marriage. Because when God values marriage, it's not just talking about our marriage, but he's talking about our marriage. And I think we miss this part. We're so used to seeing God as our father and we are his children, which is also true. But you have to understand that there's also a different dynamic in the exclusive relationship that makes us his and he is ours. And that is the relationship of a husband and a wife. And, and, and if you look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 13 to 16, and I'm just going to read it for you here, verse 13 to 14 first. So God was addressing uh, his people who were in divorce, who were in division, and, and, and he is relaying something that is not just addressing the physical reality, but he's, here's what he's saying. You have to understand that when you divorce your wife, you are not only violating a physical principle, you are violating a spiritual principle. And here's what he's saying. Let me explain to you. Here's another thing you do, God says. You cover the Lord's altars with tears and weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her. Though she remained to you, your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord the God of Israel, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's army. So guard your heart and do not be faithful and do not be unfaithful to your wife. God hates divorce. Why? Do you know why? Because he has gone through a divorce. You're like, what? When? In the Garden of Eden. Do you know the first bride was Adam and Eve? And they were not just a bride and groom to one another, but they were also a bride and groom to God. 
Because remember, their marriage on earth was only a reflection of their marriage in heaven. See, if you understand that marriage has more weight, if you understand that relationship has more weight than the way that we've been treating it as something cheap and as something that is replaceable. God hates divorce because he's gone through it. Do you know that God walked intimately with Adam and Eve? They had, there were no shame between them. Is that right? They were walking around freely where God can fully conversate with them and there was nothing hidden. But Adam and Eve decided to cheat on God. They decided to worship another. Do you know who it is that they decided to worship? They decided to worship the devil. And worship here is coming into agreement, getting into covenant with another. And they got into covenant with the devil as they submit to the lies that the devil told. They broke their covenant with God and they have given themselves to another covenant. And in that moment, instead of having the covenant of life, they received the covenant of death. And on that day, they got divorced. Do you know? The Bible says that, well, God said it, the day that you eat of the fruit, you will surely. Do you know that word death there is the word separation? What is divorce? It is separation. Now, I'm not saying this to make you, those of you who have gone through divorce guilt, that's not the point here. I just want to let you know this is the value of what, how God values relationships. And I'm praying for those of you who are divorced and if you are standing for your marriage, I'm praying that God will restore that. And for those of you who are already divorced and you are already remarried, don't worry. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel condemned. God forgives. But now you need to treat this new marriage correctly. Does that make sense? So I, and I just want to encourage those of you, maybe you come from a family that is filled with divorce. Can I tell you that God has a new path for you? That you are going to break chains of generations. Amen. Because you're going to value marriage differently. You see, in the Garden of Eden, when humanity cho uh, choose idolatry, that is idol worship. That is what we call spiritual adultery. <laughs> you see, all adultery is, is the physical expression of the spiritual idolatry. That's what adultery is. It's being unfaithful uh, in the physical. That's adultery. Is that correct? When you are unfaithful in the physical, that is adultery. But when you are unfaithful in the spiritual, that's idolatry. Understand the difference? So this is the picture that I wanted you to see. And, and the story of redemption has been about God redeeming his bride back. You see, like when so many grooms or so many uh, brides, if, you, if, you're, if your spouse cheat on you, how do you feel? Talk to me. Come on, folks. Y'all can talk to me. How do you feel? Angry. What else? Betrayed. The audacity of this person. To stab me in the back. What else? Huh? Deeply wounded. Deeply hurt. What else? Homicidal. <laughs> Ooh, uh, if I can't have you. Nobody can. Okay. Huh. What else? Is it going to be easy for you? Sad. Is it going to be easy for you to trust another? Is it going to be hard for you to accept the person back? Somebody says no. Somebody says yes. But can I tell you that? <laughs> That's right. Do you know that the story of salvation is a story of God pursuing the bride who cheated on him? Do you understand that? As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about it. And in the story, because uh, I'm, I'm about to share with y'all some So is that cool? We're going to have story time today. Okay. Now, you have to understand that the first Adam cheated on God, but the second Adam came to redeem the bride. And the second Adam is Jesus. How many of you know the second Adam is greater than the first Adam? Amen. Amen. So you don't have to worry about that. There's only two men that ever really existed, the first Adam and the second Adam. You either belong to one or the other. Who do you belong to? We belong to the second Adam. We belong to Christ, the power to redeem, the power to reconcile. Heaven and earth has been given to all of us. And if that is the case, then there's no marriage that cannot be redeemed. Amen. 
Don't, don't shoot me down when I'm preaching good, okay? And the, and the example was clearly given. When one day God asked one of his prophets, his holy men, named Hosea. Hosea, how many Hoseas in this? Hoseas. Praise the Lord. And Hosea was a prophet. He was a man of God. He was once separated unto God. He was a holy man. And God says, Hosea, you identify with me. I am like you here on earth. And he says, Hosea, here's what I want you to do. He's like, what's that? Anything, anything you ask of me, Lord, I'll do. He says, Hosea, I want you to go marry somebody. And he goes, oh, yeah. Jesus, oh, Lord, I thought you never asked. Who, who you want me to marry, Lord? I want you to marry Gomer. G- Gomer? Not Homer. Not Homer. <laughs> Gomer. But, Lord, he, wait, 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 wait. G- Gomer? The same Gomer that is standing in the red light district? That, that, that Gomer? And God says, yes, that Gomer. And he's like, but Lord, she is a prostitute. How could I marry someone like that? God says, marry that woman. And so he pursued her and he ended up winning her heart and he married her. And can I tell you, isn't that, wouldn't that make a beautiful ending right then and there if everything just went well and, and they live happily ever after Disneyland? I mean, like, listen, that, that, that was not reality. That's fantasy. <laughs> because in that moment, they, they live a few years of happiness. As a matter of fact, they have two boys out of their fruit and labor of love. Have two boys. And so he was happy with her, and she was happy with him, or so he thought she was happy with him. But how many of you know that just because you're happy in that moment, if your identity is is still tied to what you used to do, you can't be free in the now? And that is exactly what happened. One day, this man of God, Hosea, woke up in the morning, and he was just mm, reaching and he was feeling the bed beside, and her, she was not there, and, and, and it was cold. She's been gone a while. And so he thought, oh, maybe he's, she's downstairs preparing breakfast, some Cheerios, un, unleavened Cheerios, and uh, <laughs> without yeast, kosher, sprinkled with salt. And... Uh, and he came down and he went into the son's room and she was not there. And she, he went to the kitchen. Maybe she was out in the kitchen and she was not there. And he went out into the living room and she was not there. And he went out maybe into the backyard and she was not there. Where is my wife? And so he began to look around the neighborhood and, and nobody has seen her. And, and he is becoming very worried at this moment what happened to her. And, and, and he began to maybe think the worst of the situation. Maybe she got abducted by aliens. Isn't it true that sometimes we, we, our mind can make the worst of scenarios? Maybe he was taken. Maybe she was taken by a mafia out in France somewhere. She was taken. Nobody got that joke. Okay. We need Liam Neeson. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and in that moment, she, he, he did what any man of God would. He came and sought God. He goes, God, where, where's my wife? Where's my wife? God, did you take her home like Enoch? Did you went Star Trek her and beam her away? What happened to my wife? And God said, have you checked in the old part of town? And he immediately knew what that meant. 
And can you imagine if you were him, how would you feel? His heart sank. He says, no, 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 it can't be true. I've loved her. I've given her everything. No way she would do this to me. There's just no way she would betray me now. I've risked my reputation. I've given my all. Is that not enough? Okay, if you were Hosea, wouldn't you say, I'm done? I'm done. I'm so done with her. Finished. No more. But yet God spoke to him. Son, go after her. What? You, you want me to go again to that part of town? I am a prophet. I am your vessel. I am holy. You want me to go down where? And yet he went. Because he represents Jesus. And he went. And can you imagine as he even stepped into this part of time, the red light district. As he stepped in and can you imagine as people were, maybe some of his congregation was there. It's like, Pastor, what you doing here? As he passed by the strip clubs and, uh, and the bars and... Can you imagine meeting some of his members? And some of his members, oh, my God, pastor's here. Pastor's here. Yo, pastor's here. And then he calls, hey, excuse me. And they have to, hey, pastor, how you doing? We're out here passing out tracks. We are here, you know, washing feet and feeding the homeless and Right here. Yeah. Hi, what, what, Pastor, what you, what you doing here? And he says, have you, have you seen my wife? And it's possible these are some of the men that used to be clientels of the wife. Can you imagine how that would feel? Have, have, have you seen my wife? And they would have, oh, no, I haven't been with your wife for a long time, Pastor. Can you imagine how that feels like? I, I, have, I swear I haven't seen her. I, I, wait, wait, she back in business? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Pastor. People can be insensitive sometimes. <laughs> and can you imagine him looking for her? My wife! Where are you? Mother of my children, where are you? The wife of my covenant, where are you? And as he looked around, he went to the heart of the city, to the slave market, where all the pimps and the slave traders were. And as he was looking around, he heard and seen a familiar voice. And it was the same pimp that he bought his wife from. And there she was. Standing naked next to him as he was getting ready to sell her again. And he was standing in the crowd. I can just imagine tears running down his face as he looks to her. And she has no idea. And he was in the crowd. As she stand there like a piece of meat ready to be traded. Someone of no value. She's only an object to be used for somebody else's pleasure. That is how she viewed herself. And here was the groom. In the crowd. And as the offer was being laid out, nobody would bid for her. But one hand was raised in the crowd. And as she looked into the crowd, imagine her dismay when she saw her husband 
in the crowd. And he said, I'll, I'll buy her again. And he paid a hefty price, more than he did at first. Double the price that he bought at first. It cost him almost everything. And dare I say, cost him everything that he had. Do you think it's only worldly possession that it cost him? How about his dignity? How about his reputation? But he did not care about all of that. Why? Because he steps up and said, I am your husband. Let there be no other men before me. I will marry her again. So in her shame, he clothed her. In her nakedness, he clothed her. And before everyone, he's able to get down again on one knee and says, will you marry me again? And this time, I will never let you go. You are forever mine and I am forever yours. That's God's relationship with you. Do you realize that? Maybe you have gone through unfaithfulness in your life. Can I tell you this? God won't do you like that. If anybody's unfaithful, it's us. But can I tell you this? He has given you a brand new heart. A brand new spirit he has placed within you so that you can be faithful because he is faithful. He will not deny who he is. And he loves you like that. Would you give God praise in the house today? So will you make a decision today? Because worship matters when you hate idolatry and death. Make that choice today. I hate idolatry. I hate adultery and divorce. This shall be eliminated from my vocabulary because it's not in God's. I hate idolatry and death. I hate adultery and divorce because that's the physical expression of it. No more God. I belong to the new covenant. Aren't you glad that you belong to the new covenant? Aren't you glad that he is forever yours and you are forever his? Somebody shout amen. Come on. I love that. And it continues. What time? Oh, I'm already past my time. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. And I just want to highlight that. You shall not make for yourself an image. Do you know that the, the most powerful thing that you can do is to create an image? And the most destructive thing that you can do is to destroy an image. When you create a, a healthy image of marriage, you produce something everlasting. A thousand generations. But if you destroy an image of marriage, it can go down three to four generations. Do you understand? Image is powerful. Tell your neighbors, image is powerful. Because whatever picture you have is your filter by which you see reality in. So what image do you carry in your mind? See, you were always created in the image of God. You were never meant to create for yourself an image of God when you're already created in the image of God. And by the way, anything that you create is lesser than you. Is that correct? But look at the lie that we believe in. It says, after it says, do not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or anything below. Is that right? And then you see, you shall not bow to them or worship them. Because anything that you create is lesser than you. 
when you choose to bow down to it, you choose to worship the inferior. I wonder how many of us still worship money today. You make money. You ought not be worshiping money. I wonder if some of us here worship hobby. You can do hobby, but you should not bow down to it. How many here are posting stuff on Instagram, even right now? (laughs) There's repentance all across the room. You can post, but don't be a slave to it. Don't worship. Because this idea of worship is so intimate. Worship is reserved for a husband and wife. Worship is intimacy. It is you kissing towards. It's the idea of two becoming one. So what have you become one with? Have you become one with Almighty God or have you choose to become one with other things? Then it's no longer one. It's many other things. That's what we call unfaithful. That is idol worship. That is idolatry. That's not God's design for every single one of us. I believe with all my heart that you, you need to look at your husband a little bit more. <laughs> and what I mean by that, so some ladies like, I, I need to look at my husband. No, I mean like, I'm talking about God, okay? I, I'm talking about you need to behold him a little bit more. And this word behold is a word that we don't use any longer today. Uh, can, I, can I borrow Jordan and Jessica real quickly? <laughs> Happy birthday, Jordan. Um, Amen. Okay. He is a man. Amen. Good. So, I want you to look at one another. Yeah. So, the idea of beholding, of worship is this, is gazing into each other's eyes. How? Until when? Until you can see your own reflection in their eyes. So, keep on going. 20 more minutes. Because, wow, good thing that he's eating gum. Thank you, Jesus. Because this might lead to something else. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And and worship is the most intimate thing you can give. So don't treat it cheaply by worshiping inferior things, blowing everybody a kiss. Because this kiss belongs to a husband and a wife, that you are called to behold. This is what it means. You shall not bow down to any other because this is what it looks like. You are not meant to cheat on God. You are not created for that. You were created to be faithful to the one and only. That's why the beginning of Shema, or the the greatest commandment is, Hear, O Israel, I am the Lord. Your God and the Lord is one. Here's what he's saying. I'm your only one, baby. You understand? You are mine and I am yours. And you're all mine. I love that about God, don't you? He's I am a jealous God. I will not have anybody else touch you because you are mine. Just like this. Okay. Uh, a, you see how powerful? Why, why are you crying? It's, it's because when you look into each other's eyes, when you look at love, you feel loved. When you look at love, you find fulfillment. Do you find fulfillment in the one you're beholding? Because you need to look at God. You need to behold Him. Worship matters when you behold God as in a mirror. That He is yours and you are His. Isn't that oh uh-huh. she's wiping on his shirt, that's beautiful. Okay. And he's like, Well, there goes my shirt. Um This is a beautiful picture. And and so he, here's the thing. When you behold your spouse, when you behold God, need to you need to know that he wants to lead you. He, he because that's what it means to no lo- to not bow down to anybody else, to not let anybody else lead you except for God. Because that's what it means to bow down to him, is to allow him to lead you. He is your dance partner. Yeah, yeah. 
He is your dance partner. Isn't that the story too, Jess? This is so prophetic for her. She has no idea. She is, he is your dance partner, and you need to allow him to lead you. And sometimes, even though it feels like maybe he's stepping toes, but he's only stepping toes if two wants to lead. He's only stepping toes when two wants to lead. One needs to submit. He is meant to lead, and you're meant to submit. This is you and God. You, you, can, you can take the pose of dance. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. Now, let me, let me have, let me have, a, yeah, let, let me have Cheech, uh, and uh, can you play a little something romantic in the background here, Cheech? Yeah. But you still need to let him lead you. Thank you, Jesus. Left feet or right feet is all righteous. Let him lead you. Thank you, Jesus. And, and see, as, as God began to lead, it, it's so funny, right? Even though God, you go, yeah, God, you are Lord. You are my leader. You are my king. But yet you still want to decide on your life. You're, you're married, but you're still living like you're single. You're, you're, you're a believer, but yet you're living like you're an unbeliever. Here's what happened. She said, ah, my husband, I want to talk to you about my career. And, and, and her husband gazed back to her. He goes, we can talk about your career later. I want to talk to you about your character. W- will you let him lead if he goes, I want to address your character first? Will you say, no, 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 let's talk about my career. Because my career is what matters. He's saying, no, your career will follow your character. Let me lead you. Ooh, that R&B. Come on now, Jesus. This is a holy moment. Hallelujah. And as he behold her and she behold him, he goes, I, I, let, me, let me talk to you about my loneliness. And he goes, no, I, I, let's talk about your value first. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to talk about my value. I want to talk about my, my loneliness. I, I, I need to have somebody so that I don't feel lonely. He goes, you don't understand when you have value, your loneliness disappears. Uh, let, let me talk to you about my, about my future spouse. Well, let's talk about your morality. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about my future spouse. Well, you won't put yourself out there so much if you understand that you're valuable to me. That you are, I created you to be moral, not the other way. Would you let the Lord lead you? And maybe for some of you today, he hasn't been. But will you? Let me close with this. With unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, and being transformed in the same image from glory to glory. Somebody say glory to glory. Tell your neighbors, I'm on the road to glory. Amen. From glory to glory. But you have to let him lead you. So my challenge for you this week is to begin to look at your God as your husband, the one who leads you. Isn't that a beautiful picture? This is a different way of looking at the Ten Commandments. That you belong to a new covenant. He is your husband and you're his bride. Will you stand with me? Thank you so much, Jessica and Jordan.